Is that it? Scott? Is that it? Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, so basically the soundtracks would be what I feel would be the killer app for um, transponding. Obviously some people want it for automated operation or semi-automated operation, but the real application we think is very useful, particularly for HO and N scale, is you probably realize how hard it is to get a good low frequency response out of a sound decoder. Okay, it just isn't physically possible with the transducer sizes and the resonating cavity sizes you have in those two scales to get a truly low frequency uh, sound. Now, for steam, it's not a big deal because steam is, steam is a very high frequency. It's a, a, a envelope plosive sound, so it's not. It's actually a fairly high frequency. So, even a system with very poor low frequency response will give you fairly, fairly good chuffs. Now, when you try and do a diesel, all bets are off because the diesel crank rate is quite low and it's almost impossible to get a really good low frequency sound out of the sound decoder, no matter whose it is, okay? It's just purely the physics of the matter. And if you look at the, um, if you've been next to a, like a Dash 9 or a SD60, if you've been next to a real one cranking up, you go like, wow, your diaphragm is vibrating and you're not going to get that out of a little HO or N scale sound decoder, no matter what you do, okay? You just can't get the physics to couple that much energy to the air. So we feel that the surround tracks is the right answer, particularly for N scale and for some people with NHO. If you want the subwoofer, you know, low frequency noise, it's very similar to what you get out of a prototype. So we think that for some people it's going to be a very good solution for getting a realistic sound in the layout. Now of course what happens is you have a number of transponder zones and the surround tracks knows the geometry between the uh, transponder zones and where the speakers are going to be. So it's Basically, the system automatically fades as the locomotive speed rate. So it'll fade from one speaker set to another, okay, and across multiple locomotives at the same time. So we feel that that's the correct answer for good sound, particularly for diesels, for the future. Okay? So if you're really demanding something, you, know, you can't get enough volume out of your little speaker, that's really the right answer. And we've been waiting for this for a while, decade. <laughs> so that was kind of one of the reasons we did some of the transponding stuff early because we felt that that was a killer app for um, sound. Okay. The other thing some people are using for is they're allowing them to track which particular box cars or trains. So you don't necessarily have to have a transponder every device. You'd have at least one of the, one of the engines that have a transponder and maybe one of the caboosers. And now you'll be able to see where everything is in the yard and know that they're in one section or multiple zones and track it that way. So we've seen that. You know, some people have got some pretty cool stuff going on. Um, and then obviously if you can know where your total train is from the first head end element to your caboose, you can obviously track it when it goes around the layout and that lends yourself to automation. So you can detect when you know, you've had a break up of the consist of the train and the caboose isn't following you. So there's a lot of potential for the future. A lot of people have done some interesting stuff already today. And what do we got here? Yes, yeah, so I was discussing there that if you have at least a caboose and a decoder of the locomotive transponding, now you've got a pretty good, you've got a unit train sort of um, identifier and location. Okay, next. Six. Okay, with the transponders, if you have in the layout, if you're instrumented, on your throttles, the DD400s or the 402s now, uh, you can you press the find button for the active locomotive that you're driving on the screen, it will actually flop, come up on the screen with the zone number that it currently has been tracking. So that's something that has been in the system now for I guess 10 years, along with CV readback. The, uh, okay. I didn't create these slides, so I'm just kind of reading along with you. <laughs> okay, yeah, so for, um, remote internet operations or where you have a remote dispatcher, if you choose to instrument your layout now, he can actually see what truly is in that staging yard or that hidden track section or siding or whatever. So it's another kind of use. So there's a, there's a number of different things that people can do with this if they choose to use it. And there's the last item, I forget what that is, so let's go to the next page. Okay, for transponder equipped, we have all of our current production decoders, I'm pretty sure, uh, transponding on them. I think everything that doesn't hasn't been made for 
probably 60, five or six years to date. Um, yeah, so if you have an existing decoder that predates the transponding version, you can add uh, TL1 and TF4s, as I mentioned earlier, to add on the same address, it would then generate a, a um, transponder signal that would be tracked with the decoder that's non uh, transponder equipped. <laughs> and basically, if you put those light decoders in passenger cars or cabooses for lighting effects, they'll automatically be transponding if you choose to turn it on. And the value usually is uh, CV61, we set to at least a value of 2, and transponding will come on. And these are the two little uh, add-on units. They're pretty small. They're pretty easy to get into most locomotives. So that's what we got. Right. OK, we have basically the heart of the detector system is the VDL-168. And hook up the RX-4s. The RX-4s are just basically four RX-1s. And they hook into a header, and you put them out instrument the current coming down your feeders and bobs your uncork, turn on the transponding decoder feature, you're detecting right away. <clears throat> For the operational mode, readback, the same if the train is in an instrumented section, when you, you can obviously, without any of this, you can program like the sound volume, CB58, you can, for us, for our sound decoders, you can change any time you want from a throttle operations mode, which would be directed to the address of that active locomotive on the layout. And then if you add the transponder capability and instrumentation of the uh, detectors, now you can actually, when you push the display button, it'll actually read back what the last setting was. So that's an extra feature that people, some people like, you know, it's one of those things, it's, it's an option you can have. And basically, any of the CVs in the locomotive now can be read while it's running on the layout, not trapped in a um, service mode, you know, programming track somewhere. So for some people it's convenient, it's a choice. Okay. So basically you see here we need the command, to make the whole system work, you need the command station of course, you need the auto detector with the RX4s, which are combinations of four RX1s, which will do four zones. And then you need a, <coughs> if you want, to look at the find on the throttle, you want a, a DT402, for example, or a 400. An old 400 will actually uh, do the find function. It's been in that throttle since night 2001 or two. We first started shipping. The, obviously, the decoders that you want to transpond would have that feature inside them. So you need that version of the decoder. And we've been shipping those decoders since about 2001 or two. So I, I think the last transponder that, that Dakota we made that doesn't have transponding <coughs> is it's probably around about 2002 or three. I'd have to scratch my you know, memory banks. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. Okay, carry on. Okay, so basically this is for ops mode readback. We will have the uh, command station here. And it normally hooks to the track. Do I have a, one of these okay. <coughs> okay, this will be a bit easier. Okay, we have the command station here, and it's hooked up to the track. Now, in this case, we took an RX4, one channel, which would be one of the RX1 sensors, and we instrumented the current flow in this, in this lead. And the video 168 is connected to the local near the command station and it then times and reads the current pulses from the transponder. And that allows it to work out what's going on and it sends the information back on LocoNet. Okay? And on LocoNet, this is kind of, it doesn't really flow like the network would be common to everything, but the throttle here is seeing the same LocoNet. So if you press the find button for working out where it is by location, or if you use the operations mode readback, the DD400 already knows there's a 168 in the system, and it will actually automatically put the data back on the screen. So you don't have to do anything. It will automatically, if, if it's instrumented, it'll work. If it doesn't, you've done something wrong. Anyway, so basically here, we're not doing anything but using this to instrument the, the transponder current pulses going out on the track feeders, okay? 
There's obviously, <coughs> we can also use the detection section or DC occupancy detection capability of the 168 separately for like signaling and whatever. So that's what we have. So it's, it's something, you know, some people have done and it works quite well. Anyway, carry on. Okay. So in this case, we have a booster which is expanded from the command station. We just add another track current pickup from the second RX1 in this case. And basically the DD400 or 402 here can see the local net feedback from the 168 and it would either detect the operations mode feedback command and response on this track or that track. Either of them will work. Next. Okay, so this is the RX4. It has four sets of RX1s. So that's pretty simple. This little connector plugs into the BDO-168. There's a little mark connector on the board. So you can run them at 168 with it and 168 without it. If you want transponding, you have to have this connected. Simple. Okay, this is a bunch of spaghetti. Here's the BDL-168 with the local net coming in and out from the command station. And basically, the track section is here. And typically, you'll have multiple zones or detection sections. They wire through here. In this case, I believe it looks like we're combining the current with four detection sections into one return lead to the booster. And in that return lead here, we're coming up and going RX1. And that allows us to see the current in four detection sections at the same time. We can wire it any way we want because we have flexibility with these transformers of hooking up in any of the leads we wish to instrument. So this is how we hook up. And we have, uh, there's four of them, of course, we can have eight of one BD-168. So that's, we'll give you a test on this later, so make sure you remember all this. Okay, thanks. Oh, that's it. So I guess, are you guys refreshed? I think we'll sleep it. <laughs> okay, so I'll put it back to her. She'll probably wake you up. Wake up. Um, the transponding presentation that we put together, we do have copies of that in the booth tomorrow. So if anybody would like a copy or wants to talk more about transponding, please stop by and let's talk about it in your, in your specific situation. The reason we wanted to go into a discussion of transponding tonight was to sort of pre-answer a lot of the questions at the, um, the InScale convention, we had a lot of questions about transponding, and we realized that people had sort of forgotten what it was and why they would care. So hopefully you're understanding it a little bit better. It's not an easy topic. Next. Oh, something new. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Uh, we've got um, coming soon. Wi-Fi for LocoNet. Why would you need Wi-Fi for LocoNet? You've already got duplex radio and you can run your throttles and stuff. And um, you know, you might want to be able to use something else to run it with. Does anybody have one of these? No. Oh. Uh, does anybody have an iPad? Ooh, ah. Would you like to be able to use it to run your train? No, but would you would you like to be able to go straight to a Wi-Fi device instead of having to go through your computer? Uh -huh. Aha! <laughs> Somebody wants to. <laughs> oh, you want your phone back? Yeah, it doesn't have the app on it yet. So why would you need that phone? Um, so this is the local net Wi-Fi. We're projecting to get this into production shortly. It's going to be one hundred and thirty-nine dollars, and Mr. Steve Pope from Overlook Labs, who's developing this, um, these apps, would like to make a short presentation now and show you what might be coming. Yes, sir. Just give me a, a comment. Now, I use the uh, uh, DB with the 64, the switch machine controls, and I don't have to mount them upside down to get the wire coming from the top, and you put the label on so it's now upside down. Can you reverse the way you put the label on those things so that it looks right side up when I mount my wire connectors? Pointing up to the label. You can take the label, peel it off. Just peel it off and turn it over. Yeah, now they fall off. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the stick them is not the stick is not sticking anymore. <laughs> double -sided. Use double double sided sticky tape will work. <laughs> so um, okay, Steve, what do you what do you need? <laughs> if 
you move it, you're going to be out of. Okay, bear with us a minute. More AV issues. <laughs> 